Thank you, Nadine. And I want to thank all my friends and colleagues at MASIC for this wonderful opportunity to be with you. Um, it is virtual, but inshallah, we will do it in person in Riyadh um, next year. My goal with you is to have a conversation really about the subject of this gathering, the global stimulus, what are the investment and economic implications? And to do so, I would like to propose that we cover three things. First, and building on what you've just heard, what is the context in which we're operating? And I will take what's called the reduced form equation, which is a fancy way of picking a few things that explain most, not all, of what's going on. But if you can pick just a few things, you can reduce complexity to action simplicity. The second thing we're going to do is talk about the implications for policies, particularly in the three systemically important areas, the United States, China, Europe. What is likely to happen and what should happen. And finally, we will derive some investment implications. I will no doubt miss some things, and I look forward to questions from Nadine and from all of you on whatever I have missed. Think of the global outlook ahead in terms of three Ds. The first D is dispersion. As we've heard, the IMF did revise up its global estimates, but it, what it also did is it made the difference in growth rates among countries much larger than we've ever seen before. If you look at the systemically important countries, if you look at what's happening now, Europe is in a double tip recession, China is growing, and the US is somewhere in the middle, muddling through. There are, of course, two reasons for this, and we heard them. Different stages in the health situation, and in particular, a different ability to combine public health, normal economic interaction, and individual freedom. And that's the equation that everybody is trying to solve. But there's also been differences in policy flexibility. The second D is debt, something that I'm sure my friend Stephanie Kelton will touch upon. And it's the unusual thing of the massive increase in debt. You've heard the estimates on the G20. The IMF estimates that the 25 major economies unveiled 13 trillion, 13 trillion stimulus. The US alone has injected 30% of GDP through both fiscal and monetary. And if you look at global debt as a whole for the world, it has gone up from 90% to 105% in one year of GDP. For now, it is not an issue. It is not an issue except for a few developing countries that don't have certain characteristics that I'm sure that Stephanie will talk about. But the question looking forward is, will it become an issue in different ways in different countries? Something I'll come back to. The third D is the disconnect. Again, picking up on the comments of His Excellency just now, we have seen a massive disconnect between the economy and finance, between Main Street and Wall Street. And it's particularly notable for the United States. It is the product, undoubtedly, of a very unbalanced policy configuration taken by Europe and the US for years. I want to stress, for years. And that is over-reliance on central bank. And what it has done, as you've just heard, is that it has created this very unhealthy, in my view, codependency between central banks and investors. Investors act like little children whenever there's any hint of stimulus being taken away. And central banks have no choice but to listen 
to markets in order to avoid market instability that feeds back onto economy. If you put these three things, these together, they lead to an I, inequality. COVID has been the great unequalizer and it has worsened significant trends going on in the household sector. It is no longer just the inequality of income and wealth. It is also the inequality of opportunity. Opportunities are being changed in a major way. Poverty around the world has increased. The IMF estimates that some 80 to 90 million people are likely to fall into extreme poverty worldwide because of COVID. And the UN came out with the finding that in just the first six months of, of the pandemic, we have erased a decade, a decade of progress in poverty reduction. So we are seeing worse inequality of income, of wealth and of opportunity. We will see this inequality play out in vaccine distribution, which means that the recovery will be slower. We've also seen inequality in the corporate sector. The big have gotten bigger, the strong have gotten stronger, and the weak are just surviving if they are surviving. Think of Amazon here in the United States versus the small stores on Main Street. And the other inequality we've seen in multilateralism, there's been a lot of fragmentation. Where we go from here will depend on policies. I don't think there's much debate anymore as to what is needed. What is needed is a set of policies, a comprehensive policy response that targets inclusive growth that is high and it is sustainable. The US is trying it, but you've seen already the debates have started. Is it too big? Is it too small? Is it comprehensive enough? Europe is flirting with it. There were some important advances last year, but the policy initiative is stalling. China is doing it. So in the US, the question is, can we get fiscal and structural reforms that do four things? First, immediate relief to people suffering. Second, help in, in the COVID race, in the corona race, which means you slow down infections and you accelerate vaccines. Third, having better safety nets, better household economic security. And fourth, combating the downward pressure on productivity. So far, what is being offered in the US is a two and a half out of four on these six. Europe, lagging. We are seeing some fiscal, but not enough, given that the, that the continent is in double, is in double dip recession. China is sprinting ahead, but the big question is, has it done enough, given that it will not get the tailwind of the global economy? So let me finish by talking about the investment implications. As you heard from Nadine, I used to be responsible with my colleagues to invest the money, other people's money. I am no longer, and I'm really happy about this because I think this is a really difficult investment environment. I know what I would be doing and I wouldn't be happy. I would, like everybody else, be riding the big liquidity wave. I would say if central banks are going to give us ample and predictable liquidity, no one should fight it. But I would be very nervous about it. Very. The disconnect has become so large between valuations and fundamentals, and these disconnects don't end well normally. Let me highlight this by two elements that are very important for investors. The first one is the fundamentals of portfolio construction. 
a good long-term investment portfolio has a solid element of secular positioning. Positioning for the long term. Then there's a second element of structural positioning. Taking advantage of structural rigidities of imperfection in the marketplace. And the third element is the tactical. Today, the tactical is a lot bigger than the other two, which would make me nervous because you, you don't want to become a day trader. The other way of thinking of how difficult this is, is think of the normal portfolio construct, the 60-40, 60 in risk asset, 40 in risk mitigators. These days, you have 18 trillion of bonds at negative yields, meaning you lend your money and you pay for the privilege. And those that are not at negative yields at very low yields. And there's a real risk of inflation, as Nadine mentioned, and of the yields going up. That is why people are looking at Bitcoins. That is why people are looking at gold, but they're not perfect mitigators. So even portfolio construction has become really difficult. So what should you have? First, foremost, make sure that you can afford your mistakes. When you live in such an uncertain world, when markets has become so distorted, the likelihood of a mistake is high. Most mistakes are recoverable over time. Some are not. Capital impairment particularly is not, which means lots of granular analysis, lots of scenario planning, lots of smart structuring, and then open mindsets because we are in a completely different world right now in terms of investment and the economy. Remember this unusually uncertain phrase. Decision-making under unusual uncertainty is very hard. And if you want to navigate well, and this is where I will finish my remarks, make sure you have the three elements, whether you're a business, an investor, or a government official. Resilience, the ability to stay in the game, optionality, the open mind that allows you to think differently and agility, the ability to move quickly when the future is more clear. Thank you very much.